Welcome everyone and thank you all for joining this Colour of Research collab with the, uh, the MRS EDNI Council to, uh, to reflect upon this year's South Asian Heritage Month. So South Asian Heritage Month runs annually from July the 17th to August the 18th and it celebrates all things great and wonderful from Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Maldives, Nepal, Pakistan and Sri Lanka. And this year's theme for South Asian Heritage Month is Free to Be Me. So a few weeks ago, myself and Sabrina and these wonderful speakers that are here in front of you joined a call to prepare and to see what comes naturally when we talk about Free to Be Me. We came up with some wonderful themes and experiences that we were going to delve into today. And then since that call was we witnessed the awful riots, the racist riots that happened across the country. So it would be remiss of us not to discuss that. We will do and want to talk about that to some degree during this round table. <coughs> the news and the images of the rioting, I'm sure, has stirred up many emotions in all of us. But I wonder how many of us are surprised. I think a few of us have lived experiences that have opened up the our knowledge of the racist underbelly that does unfortunately exist in this country. So among amongst the conversations and the themes that we're going to be discussing about Free to Be Me, we'll also talk about those riots and how that has impacted us and our ability to be free. I'm going to hand over now to Sabrina, who will introduce the rest of the speakers and um, get this show on the road. Sabrina. Well, thanks, Anne. Um, and thank you, everyone, for joining us here today. We really wanted to do this face to face. As you can see, we're all in the room together. We've got lovely foods that Gunal has brought in. We've got some lassies. Um, and we wanted to have this conversation about South Asian History Month um, just to, to celebrate and to talk about everyone's different experiences um, and to bring some of those things to the table. And I'd like to just kick off with an introduction for everyone. Um, and uh, I guess this is probably going to be a bit longer than our normal introductions of, you know, where we work and uh, how long we've been in the industry and all that um, stuff. But this is more about our personal backgrounds, um, our families, our culture. Um, so uh, I'm inviting the group to kind of go into as much depth as they want to, um, but we do have a time limit. So <laughs> yeah, don't keep five generations. <laughs> <That's true. laughs> um, so I thought I'll just start off with myself. I'm Sabrina Trinkatel. Um, Actually, my married name is Trinkatel. My maiden name is Qureshi, which is uh, Muslim names from my dad's side, obviously. Uh, and my mum, my mum's side is actually from uh, Gujarat, so her family from Gujarat in India, um, and so they're Hindu. But she actually was born in Uganda in Africa, so has part of that influence as well, and came over in the seventies with a lot of other people um, after Idi Amin's uh, regime, and. Um, Actually, my grandmother had never been to India, which is something I found out quite recently. Um, she was born in Africa, but she, we called, you know, we said she was Indian. She brought all her culture and all her language and all that stuff. And it was quite interesting to know that she'd not really been to India. And so that's a little bit about me. Um, I'm going to, I guess we could just go round the room if you're happy to start. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, and yeah, just introduce yourself and any parts about you that you'd like to share. Sure. Okay. Hi everyone. I'm Sienna Jumi. Um, I was born and raised in London, um, but I'm a first generation British Afghan. So my parents moved here in the 90s. Um, I have three sisters. Um, my family are all Muslim and uh, they follow the faith and they can be very folklore at times. Um, I identify as British Afghan, I'm very much more British as well as Afghan, but I've had a really interesting journey with faith as well as my identity as being Afghan and how I coexist in these two vibrant worlds. Um, and yeah, I speak Farsi at home and I am 
very proud of being Afghan. I also make a lot of videos and content um, about my culture and food and music, so I'm um, integrated really well in that way. But I'm not a typical Afghan, so when I do meet Afghans in London, they wouldn't really classify me as typical Afghan mm -hmm. because I just I look and speak and my lives are so different. Um, but I'm proud to to be both British and Afghan. That's me. Excellent. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, my name is uh, Abhijit, Abhijit Roy. Uh, effectively, I was born in India, as you can see from my accent. And uh, I was born basically in a kind of a very multicultural family. Uh, my dad was Hindu and my mom's Catholic. And I grew up as a Catholic in a very kind of a, what we would today know as a very Hindu kind of a society. So my dad was in the army, in the Indian army. So, and uh, it was a very secular place to be in. And I grew up in a situation where everybody was equal, everybody knew each other, that was very fair. Uh, till uh, my dad told my mom, till the kids are 18, I'll make sure they go to church every Sunday. So I did go to church every Sunday till I was 18. And after that, I've not been to church that often. So I really wouldn't say that I'm a practicing Catholic, but then there are certain uh, ways where I live my life, which has been, uh, has come about because of being in that kind of a situation as well. And effectively you see, I. For me, I think it's best of both worlds. So I, I celebrate all the kind of Catholic <laughs> festivals and religious things and the Hindu side as well. And I lived in Dubai for a while, for about almost a decade. So I've seen the Muslim world, I've been very close to it, uh, seen what that, that world is like. Uh, and then I came into the UK about 15 years ago. So again, being a very multicultural place like Dubai, and coming to a, a different multicultural place, which is over in the UK. And living in these places has formed some opinions, has formed some ideas, and they are, it's like free to be me. So how can you be free to be in a, in a society which is supposed to be Islamist or Islamic? I won't say Islamist. And then coming here and seeing which is much more free open society and how different that how different that is as well. Thanks, Thanks. Um, I'm Anne. I was born and raised in East London, as you might be able to tell from my accent. <laughs> Um, both my parents are from Kerala. Um, I speak fluent Malayalam. I learned to read Malayalam on um, rickshaws in Kerala because it's written in English on the front and Malayalam on the back or vice versa. So that's how I learned to read it. But um, I've got two sons who are 13 and 10. Um, they know very little about their Asian heritage, which is on me. They are mixed race and their, their dad is white. Um, I'm divorced, but the, their dad is white. And I've tried very hard with my youngest to speak solely in Malayalam, but it just is oh, it's hard. It's really hard. I'm very proud of my heritage. I love going to Kerala and going again this year. Um, because I sound like this, there's a lot of like Malayalis that, that are now moving into the, the, the country and they're like, oh, you're in Miami. It's like, yeah, yeah, I am. I am. I might have an accent when I speak in Malayalam, but like, I am. So it's like seeing, I don't know, it's difficult to sort of straddle the two heritages, the two the two cultures. Um, yeah, that's me. You're right. Like so I'm Jag, Jag Grinia. I am 62 today. Uh, I'm yeah, a uh, my daughter is 29. Um, I'm divorced. I am of Punjabi Sikh heritage. Uh, I've been, I was born in Kenya, born in Mombasa, have been in the UK, oh my God, 55 mm -hmm. plus years. Um, so I suppose most of my life has been in the UK. Um, I mean, just very briefly, my parent, my grandparents were probably similar to a lot of people who went to, to East Africa. They came from Pakistan, <coughs> went through the, um, the partition. He, my grandfather went to work on the railways. My parents were born in Kenya. Um, I mean, just a little snippet. I mean, my although Punya is my married name, it's just I didn't change it because of business. Um, but my maiden name is Rahi, which is actually not my maiden name because my actual family name is Ithan. But my father thought of himself as a poet. So he used to sign his surname as Rahi, which means oh, poet. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, that's what that is, yeah. Um, I mean, I, I suppose because I'm older than you guys, I probably have struggled much more over my life uh, in the UK with this dual culture. Um, 
because I think, you know, as you all know, I came through when girls didn't have much opportunity. Mm. Nobody in my family went to university. The girls didn't go to university, got married at 21, 22. Um, and I did none of that. Um, and I think the reason is that my grandfather, for a man of his generation, was actually very liberal. He didn't like women wearing this because he thought it was kind of slightly degrading. And he didn't approve of the Sikh weddings where the woman walked behind the man. And, you know, and I think so that's probably the, the seedling of my feminism, <laughs> which my father has had to struggle with since I was 16. So I think he always thought, where the hell has this child come from? So, but it's, it's taken me all of those decades to finally get to the point where I feel I can be, can be me. But it's been a long struggle with lots of conflict um but but i think i'm kind of getting <laughs> hi i'm abarajit singh kurana um originally from india uh no surprises um, i'm a sikh <laughs> i moved uh, originally well, born and brought up in india moved to the country in 2008 that was uk moved as an international student um worked for a for a catty center in india uh, I did marketing from up north in Scotland. Uh, family was, was very liberal. Um, religious is too strong a word, I would say, but um, we were of the school of like going to the Gurdwara um, and doing good things, uh, not doing the bad things. Um, my dad used to take me to the Sikh temple, which is Gurdwara, um, every week, I would say, to do the seva. Um, I would love to introduce that concept is like just going to the Gurdwara and just doing the right things. It's like working in the kitchen um, and just like um, serving foods to people who need, who need food. Um, so like things like that, uh, which I thought um, kept me going as an individual. Uh, yeah, so I've been, um, I've got a two-year-old son. His name is Gibran. Uh, again, uh, not a Sikh name, um, but as I said, it's um, and one of the um, the cause that I mentioned about, I'm not religious, but I'm all about karma and, mm -hmm. and uh, even though Gibran is a Persian name, see, so I can correct me maybe. Yeah. 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 But uh, <laughs> I got a bit uh, of a lecture from my dad. It's like, oh, are you sure you want to keep that name? <laughs> but I've been in the industry for about 15 years, um, worked with previous state of election agencies, um, and I'm really proud to be here. Good to be here. Good that we're discussing this. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Gordon. I'm an artist, um, creative facilitator, and somatic coach, South East London. Uh, I live at home with my mum, my dad, my elder brother, who's a musician. Musician, and um, he plays double R and a uh, very specific style of double R, like a Gwali style, which is a story for another day. Um, and I'm also a twin with the wine, like chook and cheese. I'm, <laughs> I'm Sikh Punjabi and a Londoner. It's interesting because I don't, I don't ever say that I, I don't ever associate British and Indian. I don't like those two textures together. It's not not the vibe for me. Um, so even though I'm from Kent, I identify as a Londoner because I feel that like my identity is multifaceted, multi-layered, multi-textured. Um, and I feel like so much of my upbringing has been shaped by having um, so many rich conversations from people from different cultures, different backgrounds, um, as well as the upbringing that I've had. So I've been raised with the, the, the Sikhi roots, um, but then also having the openness um, to embrace other cultures and religions and traditions. Um, music, food, Servais is yeah such a huge part of my life. I love feeding people uh, physically, but also literally in the work that I do. It's a lot about nourishing uh, people's soul and their bodies, their minds, and their perception. And I love textures in you know, shapes. shapes and mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like there's so much more to say, so I'll save it. <laughs> More of the, <laughs> as the chats and the conversation, yeah. Lovely. Thank, you. So thank you, everyone. That's like that's really great. Um, I, I I just want to touch on what you were saying, Jake, about kind of I guess your experiences like 
coming into this country and having you know, I guess, had more time to go through the changes that have happened. Um, and maybe that's from a work perspective and a personal perspective, I guess, because your work is also related to, I guess, speaking to ethnic minorities and, and diverse groups. How, how have you seen that journey kind of work for you? In terms of sort of obviously the work I do, um, I mean, I started out 25 years ago um, and it was just a little seed of somebody asking me to do some some research with some ethnic minority audiences. But I think what's interesting is the level of confidence that's beginning to come through in the people that I speak to. It's like our voices have not been heard. We want our voices heard. And they, they talk with much more confidence um, mm. with a sense of it is our right to be here. Mm. But also, I think, again, what I see with respondents I talk to is very much what we are, you know, this this kind of hybrid of cultures, and you know, they are British. They they talk about being proud of being, you know, being British, but the heritage is very important to them. Family is very important. All of those things. So I think there is that kind of sort of growing confidence. But I think that's partly also to do with the fact that over the last fifty years since I've been here, what we have now that we didn't have when I was younger was those systems and structures. There weren't Indian shops. There wasn't anywhere to listen to Indian music. Yeah. There wasn't any ra Indian radio stations or television. So we we weren't able to participate in those aspects of our culture. Yeah, it's, um, we were talking a bit before as well about like how the difference between first generation, second generation, and the coming from, you know, being born in a different country and coming here or being born here and and trying to manage that interplay, I guess, of the different cultures. And when you're sitting and having drinks with people and they're having those conversations about you know, pop artists or uh, certain games they play or any kind of those activ activities that you just have no clue in terms of what, mm -hmm. even the name doesn't sound of ring any kind of bells. <laughs> I think, how do I get into this conversation? Because I can't talk about any Indian singers or anything else because nobody yeah. knows that either. I've never really faced any kind of discrimination, so to say, either underlying or overt to that extent. A lot of people who are born here, when I look at my friends' kids who've been born here and got to unis here, I think they feel British, they don't feel Asian. Yeah. One of my very good friends that we grew up together in India, and then he's come here, he came here before I did, and he was one of one of these big uh, FMCG companies, and he feels completely Indian. Because if uh, there's in, if there's a, a cricket match, he's fully support he's fully support India. And when I look at his when I look at his daughter, she's she doesn't identify with that. She's completely feels that she's British and but obviously the kind of schools you go to, whether it's private school or public school, that makes a difference as well. So, so in now the role that I'm doing, it is important for me to understand how the football leagues work here, what yeah. Barclays, Premier League is, or saying what Arsenal is, and whether I'm supposed to have a conversation or say anything about Manchester United. Yeah, even or though anyway, I've been here a long time, I still don't know any of that. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, it's just like a water cooler moment exactly. where if you part of, yeah, yeah, you know, you talk about East End or something. Yeah. Whatever it was. Interesting, so because I'm the first gen, I still can relate to you a lot. Like growing up, I didn't, so my parents didn't really watch like English movies, like there was no English like Western songs. So like growing up, going to school, like people would be talking about like the Beatles. Like running sense of my kind of like, I live in and I'm like, I'm having to do homework at home. It's bizarre because it's like I should know all this stuff because I was born here, yeah. but I just wasn't mm -hmm. it wasn't a part of my life. And even till now, my parents are still like they've lived here for so long, but they I don't I guess they haven't assimilated in that way. Mm -hmm. Mostly because it was a struggle to fit in. Um and also because they're just so involved with their own cultures and that's just all they know. Yeah. Um, when I started reception was when the first time I held a knife and fork. I remember it was fish and chips on my plate and having this knife and fork and just being like, now what? <laughs> and like, Mrs. Lawrence, the dinner lady, they managed to put it up to me. Yeah. And I just remember feeling like, mm. I don't know, I, I, that's like still like yeah. quite a visceral feeling yeah. of like, like I'm not, be yeah, otherness and like not really belonging. And I sounded like everyone, but I didn't look like everyone. And my experience was so different to everyone that I couldn't really gel in this school dining room. Maybe I've grown to the culture where you use your hands to eat. Yeah. 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 Yeah
So my dad was in the army, and he he always used a fork and right. spoon because that, as you grow up, that, yeah. that's the way it's done. So I always use a fork and spoon. I never use a fork and knife. There's nothing so small like that. It yeah, make it all so different. Yeah, yeah. and it, it's like such a big insecurity. Yeah. I didn't know we were going to bond over cutlery. Yeah. <laughs> what happens for dinner then is all the country teams gravitate together. So the Spanish are together, mm -hmm. French are together, the Germans are together, yeah. the English are together as well. Yeah. Now, coming from Dubai, obviously you can't speak those other languages, but you can speak English. So we all gravitate towards the English table and sit with them. And I remember one of the guys, after speaking to him, had a nice long conversation. He turns around and says, you speak really good English. And said, well, <laughs> for a bit. <laughs> but what do you mean? He says, no, because you speak like the Queen's English. So yeah. I said, so what are you speaking? <laughs> In the sense of, because we're still having a conversation, right? That was the first time I started feeling conscious about the way I'm speaking. Yeah. Or what I'm saying, what kind of words are coming out. At the same time. So. I think that's the same for a lot of people whose second language is English or they're coming here for yeah. whatever. If you're going to another place, like you said, I've heard a lot of people say that. And often other people can dismiss them because their English or whatever is not good enough. Mm. You know, it sounds like actually you don't know what you're talking about, so they're not going to talk to you, whatever. So yeah, it, it's a it's a tricky thing because you're coming into a different environment, right? Yeah. Yeah. Because when I go back to India now and speak to people over there, they say you have an accent, uh, or you say there's pants and trousers. So yeah, I mean, Americans, are, Americans, yeah. Americans. Are, uh, in, in this, a lot of the Americans. Yeah. So I remember once one of my friends went into one of these stores and said, "Can okay, you show me some leather pants?" And <laughs> Just say trousers. Then she got it. She said, "Okay." The images that are coming up in my mind. That's because pants are trousers over there. That's how people look at. You know, I come from a very quite strict Punjabi family. My father wears a turban. My mother has never cut her hair. So every time I went to my parents, I always wrapped it up. You know, always. Mm. Except then I, by mistake, my hairdresser cut my hair a little bit too short and I was trying to stick it into a ponytail and I couldn't. <laughs> and I sort of thought, I'm 60 years oh, old. God, this is yeah. pathetic. You know, I go to the business world and I'm, you know, a business owner. Yeah. And then I become this little person with my parent. Yeah. So I just phoned my dad up and said, it's Sunday. Phoned my dad up and said, Dad, I'm coming to see you on Sunday. Oh, by the way, my hair is really short. <laughs> and he didn't say a word. Yeah. But he said to my sister, what the hell has she done? You know, <laughs> and it's never come up in conversation again. Um, I think it is going to be different for, for your generation. I think because you are much, I think you're you're much more conscious about thinking about your identity mm -hmm. and which bits are kind of important to you. I mean, yeah. as you said, you know, you grew up where your cultural food, music was really important. But, so you can, you're kind of thinking about that much earlier than perhaps I did. Yeah. Yeah, potentially. But I feel like it also gives more room to reject it. Right. So I think... For your parents to reject you know, it. For myself. For yourself to reject it. Because there's these two identities and I want to be more British, mm. you know, so young. And so I rejected a lot of it. Mm. Up and only up, it's only been a few years I've really been accepting of the culture. Right. And I'm now proud and I'll wear the jewellery and I'll wear the clothes. Mm. But before it was something I didn't want to identify as. So how do your parents feel about that? I think they're upset and probably disappointed, but at the same time they understood. So my dad, for example, he, he says, you know, when you have children, give them English names because in society like they're just not gonna get far with, you know, yeah. Afghan name. Yeah, my dad said the same. The same. Yeah. yeah. I don't know how if it is easier for us because I think like I, I feel like my mum has experienced a lot of trauma in me trying to be true to myself yeah. and be myself uh, and free to be me. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I think that I like it's it's a battle that I've fought, but I'm aware that she has struggled, and I think that might be part of the reason that we sort of clash because I don't. I'm so strong in my um, in my identity and my wants and my desires and what I want to be as a person or how I want to look as a person. And it is so at odds with what she wanted and hoped for me. So I don't know if it is easier, 
for my kids it will be easier because I don't have those expectations that on them because you've kind of broken the the kind of sort of yeah I feel like I've probably broken you know I've got I married a white man I divorced the white man after I had children with him like Mm. we bought a house and then all of that whole thing like there's not a lot of people in my community that have done that or if they have done that they're very much then sort of hidden away yeah. um, and I don't want to hide away like I still want to go to like community functions and my mum but well, there was a community function mum was like mm, I don't know if you should come because they'll ask where yeah. your husband really? is and I was like well a, he's my ex-husband and I, I can just say and she was just like no <laughs> so it's a real like it's a real so, yeah I think that is where you get that conflict because, you know, we live in British society, which is about personal choice, personal Mm. responsibility. And then we live in the Asian world or the, you know, Afghan world where family, you know, it's not about what you want. It's it's what the dumb thing. That constant push, Mm. uh, it is difficult. Yeah. But how have you found that for yourself kind of being... You know, again, from a work perspective, but also a personal perspective and kind of trying to navigate what you want, what the expectations are, what the wider family expectations and all that stuff. I feel like I'm just the same. I feel like I'm the exception. Yeah. Yeah, that's the same. Yeah, that's the same. Um, Because I feel like my experience, it is quite rare in in the wider pool, like my... My dad wears a bug, he's got a my dad wears a turban, he's got a beard. Mm-hmm. Um, but they're very, they're very open spirited, very open hearted, and they've always encouraged my journey. Like I studied textile design from from day one, so it was like I didn't want to do something that was like my soul is not to sit at a, a, a desk at a kitchen, you know, and even, sure. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but like I, I've always been a maker um, and I come from a lineage of artisans and creatives and healers you know all of that beautiful stuff and they've always encouraged me to follow my heart and to follow the path because they also didn't have those opportunities yeah. my dad wanted to be a table tennis player my dad's like is very sporty even today he's like he on Tuesdays he sets up um um he holds up a table tennis community. Oh, so every Tuesday he's a massive golfer, part of the golf club. Mm-hmm. Um he's retired now. So they're very, very sporty. Um so he's always encouraged me to follow my passion. Um so did textile design, ended up working in trends, and then I was like, this is sucking my soul and I can't do this anymore. Um <laughs> So for me, yeah, like they, they've been very, very supportive and very encouraging, even though it's not like the traditional path of like now you've done your degree, you know, job. get a job. Yeah. They've never ever yeah. ever pushed me, even now, like to get married, to you know, buy a house, and you know, all of all of the things. I I feel like a lot of my other friends and families they're encouraged in that way. I don't think so. It's wrong, but. It's, it's not right for me. Mm. So I feel very seen and heard and held um, by my family. And I've got very strong male connections. Like I've got a really good relationship with my dad, with my brothers. And they've always encouraged me to follow my dreams in in a, in a wider sense. Mm. Um, but I do feel, we were discussing this on the call, like from the wider ripple of family and friends, there is this like, have you not met someone here? Mm. Like just sending the occasional dating app. Mm. Um, you know, and, and it's it's almost like seeing me live live out the the life that I'm living. It almost challenges yeah. the choices mm. that they've made. Yeah. Are they really happy in the decisions that they've made, mm. the life that they're living, and all of that kind of stuff? Um, and it's not really what people say. It's what I feel when I'm in space with people. Yeah. Um, so it's like these. These very sort of silent nuances that come yeah. through, um, and then the other thing that I've I've seen a huge shift is when I was working in, in trends, and it's so interesting because they were the, almost like quite like an archetype of how you show up, what you wear, and how you present, and and I I've had to unlearn a lot of that. Mm-hmm. So I'll go into those um, agencies and be dressed in like very monochrome, mm-hmm. very like. You know, I don't want to stand out too much. I stand out already with brown skin kind of thing. Mm. Um, but I never was, I never felt, I never was made to feel the otherness from 
all the places that I worked in, but it was the otherness that I was feeling within myself. Mm. And I think the first place that I worked at, I always go back to that because it was such a global um, community. I always felt very celebrated in that. Um, but now, like, I show up and I'm full in colour head to toe. I try actually not to wear black or, like, monochrome. But I just, I try not to follow trends anymore. Like, I, I follow follow the vibes and follow what, also what feels good in my skin. Even to that brother's like, you're really going to wear those trousers? <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, it's just yeah. cotton and they're comfortable. So I feel like... <laughs> Like, I'm more attuned to, like, what makes me feel nourished, what makes me feel good. Mm. Um, and I'm learning that, not so much from my fam- from my immediate family, but I think culturally, because, again, even wearing colours, like, it's all right if you're wearing it at a, at a function, the Gurdwara, or, but then it's like, don't wear too much colour when you're out, or don't, you know, don't be too much. Yeah, so it's like, well, I'll be exactly who I am. Don't be too much, that kind of... Yeah. yeah. Only for women, though, right? Yeah, yeah. Don't laugh too loud. Yeah. Make sure your smile doesn't show all your teeth. I remember something like, yeah, like, yeah, 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 like instructions like that. It's really hard, because I do have, like, some massive math. <laughs> There's nothing I could do about it, but we're like really stunned it. But yeah, related, definitely. I'm learning and mm. moving away from what is culturally not accepted, but what are the demands of you? Yeah, and, like, and, and, who, and, and then you bring them on yourself. Yeah. And then you know we talked about what success looks like, or what mm-hmm. like do we need to get married? Do we have to yeah. kids? Do we do that whole thing? And like, um, you know, if you don't want to, and that's not your path, or it is your path, but you're not worried about it kind of thing, it's like, it it does bring that, I feel, I can see with the people around me as well, there's that pressure, even people who are not Asian as well, it's like, for women in particular, it's like, getting married and having kids, and it's like, the key thing right now, like, people mm-hmm. my age, and if they're not, it's causing huge amount of pressure, I mean, with what I'm hearing, it's I'm just thinking about my parents, like, and it's so hard to define whether they were liberal, whether they were conservative, whether they were religious. I don't know. Like, it's such a like I'm not able to figure out with what I'm hearing. Oh, really? Is that I don't know. Like, sometimes I feel they were religious. Sometimes I feel they were conservative. Sometimes I feel they were liberal. Sometimes I feel they were too protective. Like, I think the first decision that I took. I, well, I took the decision was trimming my beard. Like in our religion, as Jack was mentioning, we're not supposed to cut our hair. And my dad was, even though when I went to the barber, my dad literally called my sister and be like, he will not do it. And I was like, stop. Because <laughs> I was playing cricket. I was playing first class cricket back in India. And for six years, I'm talking about from the 16, 17 to 24, as Sikhs, you're supposed to keep your beard long, but you're supposed to, to keep it tight, you're supposed to put a gel on it. So literally, when I'm putting my gel on it, I'm like that. And <laughs> so you're, imagine me play, playing cricket like that. Mm. So for me, it was, of course, one was like, this is very uncomfortable, and this is not the way that I define myself as a Sikh. Mm. Like... So I was like, that, this is not happening. I'm going. So that was, I think, at the age of 24, I decided I'm going. And I think before that, if my dad would say, is it morning or night? Even if it's morning, I would say, if he says it's night, I would say it's night. So that's the reason that I'm saying it's so yeah. hard for me. to. And then I bought a trim. He didn't say a word. There was no they didn't say a word. They kept quiet about it. And after trimming my beard, I cut my hair at the age of 35. So I still had long hair, but I didn't have any beard. So I was still wearing the turban. And then they would not say a word, and then one day just, I just went, because I was like, that's, that does not define, of course, I will not say that on a Sikh podcast. <laughs> that does not define me as a Sikh. Like, to me, there are other things that define me as a Sikh, and I think that's where I would like Gibran to be like that, like, Wearing a turban does not define me in the sea. Like, I could not wear a turban and be, yeah. still be proud yeah. to be at the sea. But, yeah. like, having a beard does not. Like, yeah. about changing times and breaking the shackles. Yeah. I think we, that's the generation that we are living in at the moment. It's like, 
I don't care what your brother decides to do, like whether he wants to be a Sikh or a Muslim or whatever, like I don't care. Yeah. Till the time he's doing the right things. Uh, but doing the right things, which yeah. is more about like looking to yourself and be like, that's where. Yeah, and choose myself. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. it's just. Yeah. And I, I, to be honest with you, I, I don't think I even can control that as a father. Like my dad tried. Mm, no chance. It's like to me, what I've, what I've accepted is the more you press it, mm. one day they'll be like, boom, that will happen. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's where I'm trying to be very careful with your I feel like uh, at very, various journeys of everyone and probably everyone else outside of this room as well, like we've all kind of had our little battles almost mm-hmm. that we've been pushing and fighting against and testing and try, in order to try and bring it back to what how we feel and how we are trying to be honest with ourselves yeah. and live our life as free as we can, free to be me kind of thing. And it seems that everyone's kind of on a bit of a different journey, depending on your culture or your background or, you know, whatever your family was like or whatever. Yeah. And it, it's kind of, we seem to bring in bits of our culture and our, like, traditions that still make sense to us and we still want to continue to keep hold of because they're still valuable. Um, but without the... Suppression. Of, suppression and the strictness mm. and... This is the black and white. This is the box. This is how it's meant to be. Actually, it can be a lot of different ways and still be fine and good and, you know, actually better, probably. <laughs> um, why don't we talk a little bit about um, some of the riots and stuff that happened last week? So in terms of the the background, I guess, for people who might be watching this at a different time, um, last week... Um, there were some kind of uh, some riots and protests that were that were kind of started. The catalyst was the unfortunate and horrific kind of uh, murders of, of the young children in Southampton and that's so cool. sorry, Southampton. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that through false information through the media actually started to kick off these far right. Um, riots where um, these people were targeting uh, immigrants and Muslims around the UK in different cities um, and it just kind of erupted out of nowhere mm. um, over the, over that weekend and the, and, the, and the few days after that. It just seemed kind of outrageous to me. I mean, I don't know how you guys felt really at the time. Yeah, I, 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 just like, I was like, yeah, saying like confused, horrified. I think this is the first time in my life where I've actually been um, hyper aware of my brownness yeah. um, in the context to where I live. And I've always felt very safe. I've lived in an um, elderly white guy in his, um, uh, it wasn't a wheelchair, but you know, when they're in my home yeah. and electric scooter. Electric scooter, and he came charging, charging towards me, and I was just like, I'm just going to zoom out of the way. Yeah. So, wanna... And then as I moved, he like muttered some abuse under his. And this is the first time. Yes, yeah, the first time and he's like, fucking Patty, see. Um, and I was like, this is literally like yeah. 10 yeah. steps. Yeah. Never happened in my entire yeah. life. Um, oh, of course. Literally, yeah. literally around the, the, the corner, and in that moment, I was like, I can't even turn back because I don't want him to know where I live. Mm. But then I'm also like, I just walk to the high street. Um, and then in my head, I, then I started actually feeling unsafe and I was thinking, mm. shit, where is dad walking from? And then obviously my dad wears a white turban and I was like, hoping that home from the state. And I was playing out all these scenarios and I was very aware, like, shit, I'm wearing something colourful. I just felt very aware, like, I am I'm, I'm brown. Mm. are actually brown mm. and I wear gold like uh, it just became very I was just like that's oh my god gorgeous. yeah like so I took the longer route to get on that's awful that's so that's very that happened but then I was just thinking back in terms of why why is this really happening and to some extent if you just put yourself in those shoes and I'm not saying for a minute that that it's the right thing to do why are they really doing this because obviously they've been instigated uh, uh, they've been instigated by some key influencers as it happened. So they've, they've, they've said that they wanted legitimacy to start attacking and attacking the other folk as it happens. One of the things I do feel that it is a minority. 
it's not a majority of the population here. But this minority has a voice in terms of a uh, physical voice. And mm -hmm. physically, they're really able to do it. And that's what we really see. But they can be put in their place. That's one. But what it's made me do is, let's say, for example, today I walked from Waterloo all the way to Covent Garden. I didn't pull out my phone even once because I just kept looking around myself. I oh, really? Just to see that, you know, is there any who's around it? You know, just being conscious of one is obviously these guys who pick up your phones and run. Yeah, that's, yeah. A, that's, that's a different thing. Obviously. But also the other thing in terms of don't bump against anybody or don't lock eyes with somebody. You know, those kind of things which you start thinking about. Even this far right thing, and the reason why I said it's not a good time to be Muslim is because I see the far right thing happening in India as well. And there's a huge movement of far right movement taking place there. So I, can, I see where that's coming from, and I see where this is coming from. Both have a similar ideology of taking over the land, you know, mm -hmm. oh, this belongs to us, and why, what should, why are the outsiders here, blah, 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 those kind of things. That's completely wrong. It's, mm -hmm. But it, they all be fed by the WhatsApp University, the mm -hmm. uh, X University, or whatever. Yeah. Um, they don't, I mean, you okay. said you think it's the minority, but I feel like, I think a lot of people feel that way, but they're just not confident enough to go out there and get involved in that crap specific crowd. Mm -hmm. But I feel like people still feel that way. Yeah. There is that means a lot of underlying yeah. yeah. You think you're right. There is a bit of a there's the people who will go out and do something, act take action. And then there's all that silent majority that yeah. is sitting underneath. Because we've seen it with the votes, you know, in the US with Trump, we've mm -hmm. seen it in the UK with with uh, you know Farage and Brexit mm -hmm. and stuff. So yeah. it, we know it's there. Yeah. And the question is um, you know, how do we move on from that? And that's a long history of mm -hmm. how mm -hmm. we've come to this country and like all the stuff that's happened in that, which I won't try and answer here. Mm -hmm. But I guess from my perspective, I don't know, I feel like from both of you, it feels like you've actually changed the behaviour, you've changed something, something has shifted where it has never shifted before. I feel safer in... Um, areas where it is more multicultural rather than where it is specifically, um, yeah. Why? Well, and I think at the moment we are thinking about Muslims. Uh, yeah. It would not take long for that to change to any other minority. It could be Sikh tomorrow. If I know it, what you were saying, Abhi, but then one video, two videos of a Sikh man or a Sikh student doing something to a white boy on social media could. Mm -hmm. to, to yeah. things as well. I think with Muslim, maybe the, with the Muslim community, what's happened is seems to be like a targeted from the media over quite a long time. Yeah. So, yeah. So it, it has been like a concerted effort, and and I think in in contrast to what you were saying, Abby, about it being like drug takers and drinkers, I think potentially the media are showing those people to be uneducated or you know hooked on something but that that all those people that are you know national front or fascist are not all toothless yeah. neanderthals yeah. Yeah. there are educated people yeah. there yeah. that are just not being selected by the by news by itv news and sky news yeah. for like photo opportunities yeah. Yeah. because they want to be they want to portray the the extreme right as like Neanderthals is like you know imbeciles and yeah. that's not the case. I thought what was interesting was the um, part where the imam in in, in um, Liverpool oh. invited them in, mm. and gave them tea and food and stuff, and then started talking to people and there's a photo of him shaking Shake hands and stuff. And he kind of got to the point where he was basically like, "What? What? Just why are you here? Like, what are you trying to achieve?" and it wasn't clear for those people why they were there. And a lot of it, he said, just came from frustration and then just frustrated with a lot of things that are happening. And I guess that's part of how they're showing their frustration. And if they're fed the media story mm. that this is the enemy and this is the, the person or these are the people who are um, creating and making it worse for you, then let's go after that person, mm. let's go after that thing, whatever it is. It's, it's, all, just, it's, the, same, it's the same story. Yeah, yeah I was going to say, it's over 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 repeated over, over yeah. decades and millennia, like yeah, other just, minoritized yeah. groups yeah. who are also at a disadvantage yes. or cha being challenged, yeah. you, you, you choose to attack them. And actually, we're not the ones that are 
you know, making cost of living difficult. We're not yeah. the ones that taking are making, yeah. yeah, taking your jobs, etc. So, yeah. yeah, like the focus has been very cleverly manipulated by the media and by the likes of Nigel Farage and, and Stephen Yaxley, yeah. whatever his surname is. Yes. Um, but what I found really surprising and very intriguing is on LinkedIn, I've seen a lot of feeds from the Asian community, the people in terms of watching, putting the voices out and calling this, this entire thing out and also calling out their fellow white professionals yes. to mm. say something. Yeah. But nobody has actually said anything. I've seen, I've, seen, my I've, seen, yeah, I've seen a couple. I, I agree with you. Yeah, I saw a lot of people kind of saying, well, where is your voice? You know, you yeah, support. it's where we need that allies. And I think it, it, I think it was in Walthamstow where there was five fascists and all of Walthamstow yeah, came I was out. Gonna say, there were a lot of anti-racism groups yeah. that mm-hmm. then came out over yeah. the next few days and stuff. And, huge amount of people came out mm. in support and that that was quite warming it just... i think we've spoken as well about how our allies are the majority and yeah. you know we do need for them yeah. to speak up yeah but our voices also yeah. to be heard it's nice but it's still it's still so triggering mm. because for, for those who have experienced the racism like for me growing up i grew up in a really white neighborhood um, and it was really racist. Like they would attack our house, my parents, and everything. So like having those experiences and seeing it all again, mm-hmm. it's like God, I'm back in that space. Mm-hmm. But it's nice to see the allies coming out. But it's like I'm having all these memories and these like places I'm taking back. So I spent so long trying to leave behind. Mm-hmm. So it is really interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I was in, in, on a call last week and it was just shocking just to witness like white folks just dismissing experiences of oh, uh, yeah. a few, there were a few people of colour in the space and even that and it's like because the majority of the space was white it's like okay you know we're just going to kind of gloss over these racist riots and we're going to call them protests so I think even like the language that we use like there's a lot of work to be done yeah, and, definitely yeah. and even like even I've been reflecting a lot on like my friends who are white who have all white friends and I'm the, the, the minority in that what does that say about them and about our relationship as well so I think you know for one reason or another um you know I think that actually sometimes it just doesn't register because you just don't know you just don't have an experience it so it's about like you say having these conversations and other people hearing what that feels like and what it's, what it's actually doing yeah yeah um hopefully this conversation yeah and exactly. people who will be watching will hopefully i don't know think yeah a little bit more like to I think it is about conversing and talking and be able to yeah, it's have like, those discussions you know one aspect of this is like how like how proud or how kind of how, how does it make you feel to be like south asian because we haven't we've talked a little bit about some of the more like tricky challenges i guess and the issues but actually like for me and i think you said as well you celebrated in like work in the workplace and things like that and it's kind of i always feel like I'm slightly different, but not in a bad way, in a, and actually a good way. I'm bringing something different to the table, um, you know, I'm bringing a different perspective, and I appreciate other people who can see that as well in the workplace, things like that. So, um, but I always feel like slightly kind of not Asian enough, not British enough, and all this stuff. So I do feel a little bit. I feel I actually feel more British or I guess white in a sense than I do Asian. So I always feel a little bit uncomfortable around more Asian people because I'm like shit. I don't so know funny. what you're talking about, <laughs> and I don't know the language, and I don't yeah. speak any other language, and I don't you know know these terms that you're using and all this stuff. And so I feel like actually I'm a bit more white, um, but. In terms of being proud of being South Asian, I'm, I'm re- and a bit like you, kind of trying to embrace that more and more as much as I can and integrating it. I had, you know, I wore a sari when I got married and all that stuff, and I really wanted to have that as part of what we did. Um, but yeah, it'd be interesting to kind of hear like, you guys. How do you feel proud? Do you feel, or do you not feel proud, or do you don't mind? And connected to that, 
do you actually feel like you can be yourself? Like, can you be free right now? That's a super question. Yeah. 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 I can start. For me, I think this country has been very accepting. From the time that I landed, uh, this was in 2008, of course, again, uh, going to the university, very accepting, getting my first job in London after uni, very accepting, like, about to be a Sikh, that turban is not going off anytime soon. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's 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 me, uh, if that was really the question. Do you feel like you can be your full self? Do you feel like you can, like, the free to be me kind of statement? Yeah, yeah, but not professionally, yes. But the, the conversation that we had about being a part of a cricket club, which was white dominated, I felt, um, and then I gave up on that uh, that membership. But at work, I never felt that I was never part of. Like if when, when I, I was always when I was given the um, the freedom to to be myself. Like I never felt that I was not given the freedom to be myself, even though I was wearing a turban or whether I was coming from India, whether I was not um, born and brought in the UK. That was never a challenge for me personally. Yeah. Do I? call myself Indian or do I call myself now that I've got a British passport and do I belong here? And it's it's quite difficult now because I'm getting more more and more disappointed with what's happening in India right now. So I don't say with pride that I'm Indian simply because of what's of political situations or you know whatever's happening from a religious perspective and all that. So the moment I say yes I'm Indian, but then I'm a bit embarrassed to say that as well because Personally, I'm not comfortable with what's happening there. So therefore, do I say I'm British, but I've not lived here my entire life. So I'm not British either. So right now, it's kind of caught between the two worlds. Yeah. And obviously, having lived in Dubai as well for almost a decade, which is a big part of your life, it dilutes that even further. And then, so right now, I'm kind of in that very uh, one leg here, one leg there. I think that's really <laughs> crazy. I, I think that's fine because we're multifaceted. Cool. There's so many different pieces that make up the puzzle of Abby. Probably feel like I'm more British, but I do feel proud to be Carolyn Indian. Fair. Um, uh, yeah, I also feel like I'm struggling to look at the, both sides, but I feel more comfortable about it. There are challenges and etc. But yeah, I feel I do. I am. Yeah, I do feel proud. Like I, if I feel I, I don't know. If, Free to be me. That's a little. That's more tricky. I. Uh, it's like I would say that it's been like challenging, and it's been like a bit of like a battle, mm. and the battle is with you know my mum and the community <laughs> specifically. I think it's like I do feel free to be me because I'm in this country, and mm. had I been raised in Afghanistan, the situation would have been so much different. And it's like it's a constant battle of being reminded that I could have been somewhere else. Yeah, I could have had such a different life. But do I feel comfortable to be me, which is these two identities? No, because in each of these spaces, I have to hide certain aspects of who I am. Mm. You know, whether that's the language I speak, you know, the culture I'm from or the type of person I am and the lifestyle that I live. And I think if there's a beauty, but there's also a struggle in it. Mm. And I feel like it's going to be a long journey. And I think the end goal is to just be comfortable mm. in who you are. Um, and I'm striving towards that. But at the same time, I'm so proud to be like for, from Afghanistan, but also from the UK. Mm. Because it's given me an opportunity to be and explore who I am. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, I, I would say I'm really proud, but it's a challenge. How about you? I feel like I'm fully me. Oh, oh you're the gold. Oh, you're the gold uh, standard. Yeah, and I feel like um, with all of us, like all the people I meet, I feel like we're constantly evolving. We're constantly becoming. So I'd be saying, you know, five years ago, I was writing that post. It's like that was who you were then five years ago, but you're who you are now. So how can we, yeah, embrace and accept like this is all of us, all these different facets that make us us um yeah I feel like I I've never actually had the feeling of having a dual identity mm. ever um which is yeah a conversation for another day so I feel like 
my ground, my feet are fully grounded here. And I think if I was still in the trends world and the market research, I think it, I would be a different person. Mm. But the fact that I decided that it's not this and to create my own thing and to do the work that I do, which is all about personal and collective liberation, I feel I'm a, becoming an embodiment of that. So I feel like I'm here. And that's also because of the roots in Sikhi, in the divine, mm. and that spiritual aspect that is there that holds me. So even when all this stuff is happening around us, um, I'm here mm. and I'm fully me. And it's taken time, I think, more so with family to show more like my artist side and for that to be accepted. But I think, not even I think, I know that I belong to myself before I belong to anyone. Mm. And whatever come what may like I'm here and, and I'm full I'm full in what I do in, in the work that I do the people that I connect with um and that brings me a lot of a lot of joy and a lot of love and a lot of resonance so I think if there's resonance in yourself like working on that rather than on like what other people what the culture says society like it pulls us away from what is what is the truth mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I feel. Yeah. I could do with a few sessions. Yeah, yeah. why? I love yeah. that for you. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, happy to. I think we should end on that note. Yeah, yeah. I agree. I don't think we can top that. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what the work is about. How do we come to our texture? Yeah. 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 yeah, and that's what the work is about. How do we come to our texture of truth? How do we come back to ourselves and align? Because mm. our whole life, like everything that we've chatted about today, culturally, societally you know everything in life is pulling us away from what is actually the truth so that's what the work is how do we come back to mm -hmm. to our center and, and actually root in there rather than of what other people expect mm -hmm. us to be it's like i see myself first and i embrace all these facets being a londoner a woman mm -hmm. and single da -da -da twin mm -hmm. this is all of me and i bring all of that into yeah. work um thank you so much William. that's such a beautiful way to round off this session um, and thank you, everyone. Like you've all been so open and vulnerable, and um, I've appreciated hearing everyone's stories. Um, and thank you, everyone who is hopefully watching this. Um, I hope that you've found it insightful, thought-provoking, um, questioning, joyful—all those good things and lots of lots of different emotions. Um, I want to say thank you very much to Opinion for giving us this space. Um, Sabrina and the MRS ED and I Council, thank you very much for collaborating with us. We appreciate you and your time and everything you guys do for the industry. Um, please do follow MRS ED and I Council on LinkedIn. And of course, please continue supporting Colour of Research. We appreciate and love you guys for your support. Um, and I think that's it, really. Is there anything else? And thank you both for facilitating this and oh, creating yeah. these new connections. I feel I felt from the first call I was like this group's gonna be a vibe. Yes. <laughs> I'm looking forward to Abby taking us on a food tour. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> sorting us out. Yeah. Loves that. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot for for you know kind of arranging this and uh, all of us to have voices. Uh, yeah. Because well. so I think that's really thank important. You. And for the rest of the uh, we're just a small group of. People like us who are working in the industry mm. as well. So this has mm. really pushed some thoughts into their heads. Yeah, definitely. Maybe Follow on the conversations. Yeah. So thanks to South Heritage Month. Yes, yes. Thank you, Sia. Thank you also to South Asian Heritage Month. Yeah. <laughs> thank you for thank you, South Asian Heritage Month. Uh, we look forward to what you're doing next year as well. Thanks, guys